Okay, today is September 7th, 2010. My name is Mary Larson, and we're here at the Meisner home with Carol Meisner, who's going to be talking to us a little bit today about their time, her and her husband's time in Ethiopia uh, for OSU. I'd like to start by getting some general biographical information from you, if I could. If you could just tell me a little bit about your family and where you were raised, where you went to school. Well, we grew up in Pawnee County, and I went to school at a little tiny town called Merrimack. Mm -hmm. And from uh, that little tiny town, which I did not want to stay there the rest of my life, I went into a nurse's school mm -hmm. and uh, I finished uh, and got an RN. And when I came home, well, we started a family, and so that was about as colorless as a life could be, but... <laughs> well, where um, did you go to high school in Merrimack? In Merrimack, okay. uh -huh, which is still there today, mm -hmm. but the school is not. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father farmed and my mother was a homemaker. Mm -hmm. There were six of us children. I was next to the youngest. Okay. And uh, the there was nothing special. I didn't play basketball. I didn't do any great thing except I love drama. Wow. So I'm still doing it. <laughs> I know how to do drama. <laughs> well, no, I, I enjoyed our school had view, very few girl activities. Mm -hmm. I wasn't allowed to play basketball. So, and I wasn't good. But I did, they, we had class plays every year and I made sure I was in every one of them that I could get in. So, that, What was your favorite? Probably my freshman. Mm -hmm. That my freshman, when I first started, but they all were my favorite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you remember what the play was? It was called Aunt Tilly Goes to Town. <laughs> and it just was kind of a, a supposedly funny, and. It, what it, we did at the time, since school was, schools were very segregated in the 40s, mm -hmm. I played an African-American and was the cook for the, the, the play setting. I, and I loved the part. I could speak the mm -hmm. lingo just fine. So, <laughs> so I, for myself, I never ever felt I, I never did have a feeling of racism, never did. And I think part of that was, I was human, you know. And I think that had something to do with it. I, I loved the part, and in fact, I played different parts later. I was even a Chinese once, you know. <laughs> so why? I was an Italian instance. once. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was, I like to do that, and I like to imitate. Mm -hmm. So it was, that was a fun, that was my fun part of high school. Mm -hmm. So once you graduated from high school, where did you go to nursing school? In, at Hillcrest, it was a hospital at the time called mm -hmm. hospital, uh, in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. I never was a nurse's aide mm -hmm. until I, a few years ago, I worked at a nursing home and you do everything there. So I, but I went from high school right into nursing. So. Okay. Now, um, how did you meet your husband? He had come to my house mm -hmm. to take my younger sister and her friends on their graduation night wearing robes and caps and things. They went to Pawnee, mm -hmm. and I just happened to be home on vacation. I was graduating. He was graduating from OSU, and so my mother said, have you ever met him? And I said, no. So she introduced us, and so he took me to the movies, and we got married that October. Mm -hmm. And what year was that? <laughs> that was been in 1953. Okay. This is our this is, we are 57th wedding anniversary this year. Well, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I think so. Now, um, when you first got married, 
where were you living and what were you both doing at the time? He, we, he had to, he had been deferred mm -hmm. in the Army, from the Army to finish, get his bachelor's. So he got his bachelor's, we got married, he finished his farm work, which he had a cotton crop to get out. And then in December, he went to um, Camp Chaffee, or Fort Smith, for, and I stayed in Pawnee and worked another month or so. And then I moved to Fort Smith with him, and we got to stay there the entire two years. That, well, it, he got out two months early to go back to school, work on his master's. But um, I worked as a, a, a supervisor of a nursery in at Sparks Hospital in Fort Smith, and so that it was just like a job to us. It was we didn't. Other other people would say, "Oh, I hate this place," <laughs> but it was home. We could every month we could come back and visit our families, and so we enjoyed that. And then he got out two months early, one week before our daughter was born. We came back to Stillwater, and. Uh, he went back to school, and I had a little girl, and then I went back to work. The GI Bill did not pay much money then. <laughs> so I worked in the old Stillwater Medical Center in obstetrics. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's your daughter, Marilyn? No, oh, that okay. is the daughter, Luann, who is almost 55. Mm -hmm. She will be next week. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you and your husband end up going over to Ethiopia for LSU? He was in the agricultural department and he, they approached him about that and knowing that I also was a nurse and they were wanting to start the university down at Hara. So the White Knacks were going to transfer and that left an opening for a nurse agriculture person at Jimma. And when he came in, as I said, I had to ask where it was, but we, we um, let, they, you know, they did everything for us. All we had to do was, we didn't even have furniture to store. It was, we just had never, we'd always lived in an apartment. So it was not difficult to throw our things together and away we went. Mm -hmm. we enjoyed, we enjoyed Washington, D.C. Took, we went early enough we, and and went on to New York City and toured Manhattan and a few things too, you know, on the way, carrying a nine-month, very heavy little girl. <laughs> <laughs> just at that age when yeah. you're just a little... Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then then when we, we got to uh, Rome, we spent another, oh, maybe 24, 36 hours there. Mm -hmm. Got to see things that we wouldn't, that we only had read about. And in Cairo, the soccer team, Ethiopia only had one airline, and the soccer team had used the plane. So the family we were traveling with, which was the Wiggins, uh, we got to stay in Cairo uh, while that, till the plane could come and get us. So we got to go to the pyramids and see the museum and all of the things that you hastily get to see in, in Cairo. And uh, then on to Ethiopia. Now, when your husband came home with this offer from the university, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what were the things that you took into consideration, or were you both just so excited about it you just jumped on it? We jumped on it. There, I'm an adventurer, and when I think if anything, he was kind of surprised that I was <laughs> quite so willing to go. But uh, I was, and I, I waited, and you know, we did apply, and then it seemed like it took them a long time, it t was to me, to whether they told us we were going or not. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it was only, I think, about April when they started hiring BOAG teachers that he, they pushed Lewis. They said, make up your mind, you know, uh, because we, He'd have to get a school, and so they, he pushed on them, and they they gave us the go-ahead answer. So we went ahead. 
And they were hiring your husband, but they were also hiring you for right. the people it was, that don't have the background. Do you want to explain a right. little? Well, his was agriculture, mm -hmm. and since it was agriculture business, he could fit in almost at any any place. Mm -hmm. uh, he did horticulture while he was there, but uh, his his minor had been in animal husbandry, so that could have helped. And um, they it was just set up as a pair that uh, now since I had a child, they only would allow me two fifths. Time. And you, I was on call 24 hours, you know, but it was uh, just, that was their rule, ruling, and it sounded so good to me that that much money, I had not made that much money, <laughs> wasn't a whole lot, $2,500 a year, doesn't sound like a lot now, but, um, and it wasn't, <laughs> but it was good for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, we grew up with on shoestrings, really. It was hand-me-downs and cornbread. That was the main thing. <laughs> well, now, um, you mentioned that you didn't have to take care of packing a whole lot, basically. No. You didn't have to take a lot with you. Well, they gave us a list, mm -hmm. and we pretty well went by what we had to have. I also contacted uh, Gwen Whitenack about what should I bring in medical supplies, and she sent me a list. And the college filled up the the uh, clinic at the or the infirmary at the college filled it for me, and I didn't know what I'd need either. It was hard to know what do you what do you take for two years? Your antibiotics aren't going to last that long, you know. Your what do you take for pain medication? Do you not take anything, or you? And uh, that was kind of a hard thing for me that to know what to take there. But Gwen sent a, I thought, a, a very good list, and they filled it just like she said. Mm -hmm. And if there was anything else I needed to put on it, which I can't remember that I did, but because I didn't know what I'd need, then uh, that, that took care of that, and, and it was shipped. They did all the shipping. We, we just took, you know, like a baby bed and high chair and things for a child mm -hmm. and our clothes and that was... <laughs> now, mm -hmm. um, where were you assigned to live and work when you got to Ethiopia? We went directly to Jimma mm -hmm. and the house, the housing was furnished, which you've probably heard this before, they were old Italian houses that had been restored, but this had been a school, an Italian school before. and. We had a dormitory that housed about 200 boys, and really the cream of the crop of, of Ethiopia because all the boys wanted to go to school. So they had to be screened carefully. And it was entirely an elementary, uh, excuse me, a, a secondary high, high school, starting through the 9th through the 12th. And they were, they were great kids. They, I can't think of any of them that we, we sponsored, each one of us would sponsor a group, see, and they became our kids, actually, they are, they, and Lewis worked in, with gardens with them, and he became very close attached with them, of course, then the next year you start over with the next class, but uh, the, it, the, my, he taught them how to grow the vegetables that I pushed for them to eat. That was kind of the way we did it. <laughs> that's that's um, a good a yeah. good uh, yeah, backup plan. <laughs> right, because I they did they gave me the job at, besides being the, the nurse there on the compound, both for staff and students. I had a helper, but um, uh, they also gave me a class. They called it hygiene, you know. I call it health because I did a lot more than, than hygiene with them. You had to adapt to what they had. They're, if they went back out into the country, they didn't have running water. And often we didn't have running water because our wells would, would not always produce. And at first we had electricity only part of the day. So it was, what I tried to do was then push the fact that 
that cleanliness will help to uh, curtail disease and hand washing was elementary but very important so it was just small things like that and um, but I enjoyed that class you'd have thought I was an A1 teacher I loved that class so much <laughs> Well, just and, oh, go ahead. well, I I did that for I think about three of the five years that I got that class. Mm -hmm. Well, just to go back to some of the mm -hmm. things you'd mentioned a little earlier, you talked about the and this is somewhat something that people haven't mentioned yet, the fact that the school at Gemma was actually an old Italian school. Do you okay. know what the background was for that? Or? Uh, my, the, I'm. So I'm ashamed now that I, oh, when you're older, you would have dug that out better. I was so afraid of picking up some germ, I guess, that I didn't really study as well as I could have. I didn't learn the language, and I messed with it, but I didn't learn. But the history, the little history that we had was the school, uh, the Italian occupation, I think, was in 35. And they came in, and they built and built and built. And uh, then after the World War II, then they kind of ran out, except who the emperor wanted to keep. But they just, the Ethiopians destroyed a lot of the road building and burned off the tarmac is what had happened. And hmm. underneath the tarmac is just big rocks. So you had a real bumpy ride if you if there was any left at all, <laughs> that's what, in Gemma. Now mm -hmm. that's the way we were, uh, and we were at the end of the run, the run from Addis. It would take all day to get from Addis to Gemma because it's narrow and it was hilly and, well, quite mountainous. And so, uh, so all these buildings were just kind of left in decay. Um, the first group that went over had them all put in shape for us. So, time I got there, my house was was in good shape. And you folks got there which, which year? It, it, we went in 56. 56. Mm -hmm. And so I had, uh, I, I felt like we had a good place to live, and mm -hmm. partly because living here in Stillwater, if I told you where it was, you would understand. But the house was just a little garage that had been turned into an apartment, and it it was not very nice. So this this two bedroom house <laughs> with a bath in it and a, a nice big open room for dining and living room, it looked like a mansion to us. So palatial, <laughs> right? And, and it was all, it had been lived in. I mean, they had to, it was very clean and, and cool because of the high ceilings and the thick walls. But it was very, it was very comfortable. I had no complaint about our living conditions at all, except the electricity would not come on until two in the afternoon and then it was off, I think, it seemed like around 10. So we had to use a kerosene uh, refrigerators or some and uh, a washing machine was not the best piece of thing to take but I did they said bring one if you have it and I don't remember was first or second I cannot remember first or second term that mm -hmm. I took a washing machine back but I was sure it was the first time but they couldn't use it until after two in the afternoon so, and of course we so was that the case on the campus too? We, that was the campus. Yeah, we just used the city mm -hmm. uh, generators and and uh, went. But we did have our own water wells. They that also ran on electricity. So because they were deep, and the fluorine, the fluoride was so high in that those wells, we still boiled it and still took precautions. But that it was such high fluoride. If we'd have only known that. The children, some of the young children's teeth became spotted white mm -hmm. from over fluoridation. And uh, in fact, our daughter had her teeth all capped because of that when, 
when the when the permanent teeth came in, they were spotted with with white spots, and they she didn't like them. <laughs> and, but does my our son didn't have that. He he was only two and a half when we came home, so he didn't he never had that problem. So his baby teeth might have been uh -huh. that way, but not been, as permanent. Yeah. yeah, and it didn't didn't seem to affect them. But some of the other children, I learned, had the same thing. So now, were there any surprises? I guess I should say with the living conditions when you first got there. I guess because I felt like we had a good place to live, because when you think of Africa, you don't think of how modern that it could be, and really it quite even back in 56 to 61, we found where the places we went to was very modern, and uh, I, I, I think part of the fact was we you know, you're in Africa. It's not going to be um, Midtown USA, and it was not. I didn't feel like we had an, a difficult time adjusting at all. It was the flies and the the dirt that kind of was hard on all of us. I mean, all of our pictures, we go around knocking flies out of our face, and the children, if they'd sit down, the, they'd get flies on them, but. We just, you just take it. This is what we thought. Now it's, I'm sure it's not that way today, but it was 50 years ago. So, and at mm -hmm. that point, because mm -hmm. of the Italian occupation, mm -hmm. they were doing a lot of rebuilding, which is one reason right. they were starting the school mm -hmm. of Gemma and then the, the That's agricultural right. college. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the emperor wanted that. That was his dream. Uh, Air Force, after being bombed pretty heavy, I guess with. Uh, during the occupation, and then he, his dream was to have a university at his birthplace. So that's, we just never, we went, came home before going, we didn't even push to go down there. It was, it was pretty well built up and lined up. But, and Down at Alamaya. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we did go visit, we did, I, I've been there and just visited, but we were, I think at the end of five years, we were ready to come home too, so it was... Mm -hmm. Now, um, where did your supplies come from, both your household supplies and your medical supplies? You said you shipped a lot of the medical supplies. Over. To, I, I, we had a pharmacy mm -hmm. <laughs> downtown in Jimma. It was just a store. They might only have one bottle of vitamins, but it was, I could, um, our medis, medications and what the Ethiopians had been used to was not the same. And it would, so I kind of used our medicines for the staff. And I knew ahead of time, this, this was not a new thing. I knew ahead of time we had a, a doctor from Germany that was contracted by the Ethiopian government. And they had a little, well, it was quite a hospital, but it was very, if you ever saw anything primitive, that would be it. And without electricity until two o'clock, it was hard to get an x-ray or, or, so even then we didn't do x-rays, they did fluoroscopes. And I, there was also an Italian doctor there, but he didn't, he was like me. He wouldn't learn English, and I wouldn't learn Amharic, and he didn't either. So, uh, but some this this German doctor could speak Amharic quite well. And do you remember his name? Yes, it's we called him Ruder, but it was spelled R E U T H E R, Reuter, kind of. And I remember him because he delivered our children for us. You know, mm -hmm. he delivered uh, one for the Evans one for me mm -hmm. and one for Kindles. So, yeah, I worked closely with him with the students especially, but he was, he worked with the staff, but it, there's your socialized medicine. He was paid a salary and so they didn't like for him to leave during working hours. And, and so he was at the hospital? He was generally. at the hospital. Uh -huh. 
and but nobody wanted to go out there and have a baby. I mean, this this is you might think it was only like 20 years old stuff from Italy, but it was the most barren thing you could ask for. And I do remember when we went in, once I took some boys in, our tuberculosis was, was kind of uh, prevalent there. So I took boys in for x-rays. And I just take so many a week. And we didn't have an x-ray machine, so we would have to set up a time after two o'clock and use the fluoroscope. So we went out and we went into this dark room and both the doctors sat down and the, folded their hands. So I sat down and folded my hands. I thought, are we gonna pray or what is this? Well, it was getting our eyes used to the darkness and <laughs> I learned that the first trip, boy. I, I thought, of, well, I am dense. But uh, then they turned on this fluoroscope, and we could, we could see. And he just had the boys. He'd look sideways, and it, then we, the school, just paid him a certain amount of money for that. But that was, um, it, I mean, they had to go to the hospital. Everything went through the hospital, and to go to the record room, you would have been shocked. But they seemed to know where their records were. I just couldn't have found them, but <laughs> they they made it through very well, and I I just marvel at how those kids lived like that. And I really I really did. They felt like they were way way above. You know, they they didn't act that way, but they. I think they really felt their fortune, that there's a lot of kids out there that would trade their lives to get to be here. And I thought they were very good students. I, I don't, uh, I mean, they, my, my main focus there was on health. And so I didn't try to interfere with any of their teachings or anything, because I didn't know that much. But. It was, when I think back, I just think of that was a great bunch of kids. I really, each year, each year we graduate out about 50 and get 50 more. So, yeah. You mentioned sponsoring mm -hmm. a group whenever they came right. in. So you'd kind of be the house mother and father for a well, group? Or we, was it? We gave them, we took them on, they, we, I don't know that we, we just sponsored any activity. Like okay. Halloween, they didn't have Halloween, but we made Halloween. We gave our children Halloween. Well, they needed to understand that was why we were doing this. Um, Christmas parties and graduation. If if you had an, uh, the older classes when it came graduation, well, we did. Um, Marsha Turner taught music and taught them to sing, and and they had plays. Well, see, there I like that. And I just thought anything that we could do to give them some outside activities, but we'd bring them down to our house. And it was usually, the, the rainy season was summer. So we could, and it was nice outside. So we had outside, we sat in a circle outside, and they didn't have to have music. They would start with their clapping. And it just went, Makes me homesick. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Do you want to take a quick pause? No, I just, okay. I just thinking about it. Mm -hmm. You'll so, take it out. Oh, you will. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and with, so would you have just a small group out of the fifty that would come in each year, each or class. each each class? We had a class. Okay. We'd have, we'd have nine A and nine B. Okay. Know, and then you, and there was about twenty five kids in okay. each one. And it was just, a, they loved our cookies and Kool-Aid, you know, things of that, that was, we thought would be simple. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But they loved that. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was just fun to have them that way. Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand their singing, because they did do it in Amharic. Mm -hmm. But it was how they did not have to have any musical instrument. They did it with rhythm and, and, and their hands. 
Now, the Kool-Aid issue brings mm -hmm. up, it brings us back to the question of supplies. Okay. Um, where did you get your, your groceries? Was that all in Gemma as well? No, no that was more from, uh, all, all of it we ordered from a commissary in Addis. Okay. The, all of the Americans there, embassy, everybody, had uh, access to this commissary. And we would send in an order. And we had a, one of the women took care of that. And we would send in an order. We got about once a month or something. And when we took groceries with us, things that were non-perishable, we had, and we each had a storeroom to put those in, and and then to keep uh, add to it. Well, we uh, just ordered from this commissary, and they did the ordering from wherever. We used Danish hams and and bacon from somewhere. It was in a can, and <laughs> and it was. Uh, they wherever it came, you know, and and so the 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 people in Addis actually took care of that, and we just order from that. Uh, they also stocked spirits, but Lewis and I neither one drank, so that never never uh, we didn't have any problem with that. Uh, they kept cigarettes, which again we didn't smoke, so but they did for those that did. So you know, it was very well rounded. Our biggest shortage was fresh fruit. We could grow the vegetables, but our fresh fruit was a little harder to come by. And it, if they got any down in that little Italian store downtown, we just descended on it, you know. And for the people that they really shipped it for, I think, didn't get any. But the Americans, that was our, our big treat, was fresh fruit. Um, Later, we got Coca-Cola in bottles, but at first it was just syrup and we bought fizzy water <laughs> and made our own. We'd have a strong Coke or light Coke or whatever, <laughs> but that that was the first at first, but it that graduated in until we actually could buy bottled Coca-Cola then. And, and, oh. and everything was shipped in by a truck. Uh, now, when I say everything, I should clarify that. We did have a plane in and it would stop of a morning and then it would go on down into the country. I don't know where all it stopped. And in the afternoon it came back and went into Addis. So each, just pretty much each day we had one plane in and one plane out. But um, unless it was needed for, and they were cargo planes. They weren't passenger planes. It was just cargo which Everything came on the cargo plane from sheep to <laughs> to people. Like, now, you know, I was going to say that's the other question. You mm -hmm. know, we talked a little mm -hmm. bit about where you stopped on your mm -hmm. travels over to Ethiopia, but you had mentioned when we were talking well, earlier that you went, went over by farther. by went, ship originally. No, or no, we flew. You flew uh, okay. uh, the first first time. Then we for our first furlough, which was after two years, since it was a two-year contract. Uh, we took the first class ticket and, re and turned it into a coach class and went through the Far East. Wow. So that way we could go to Aden and across India, Karachi, those were places. And then Hong Kong, we all wanted to go to Hong Kong. And from there in Tokyo. So we actually made one trip clear around. And, be and six weeks later we started back where well, we came back through went to Brussels. The World's Fair was at Brussels that year, so we went there. And uh, I think that, oh, London. We did stop in, in London. And then, then we came back. We, the, we waited three years to come home that time. And we flew to Frankfurt, and we had bought a car. So we drove from Frankfurt all up, all up through Germany into Holland and across to, we went to Brussels again, and, and Collie, France, we crossed over to Dover, and then we drove around in England and put car and came to New York. So, okay. so when, you, when you had these breaks, how much time off did you have between when you left and when you needed to be back? Was it basically the summer? 
to the well, end of the semester, beginning of. Uh, actually, we just I just think we took like two weeks vacation. Okay. You know, and that's what they gave us. I think was two weeks because mm -hmm. the gardens had to go. They mm -hmm. had to keep being watered and cared for, and and uh, things were gotten ready. The school year wasn't quite the same because of the rainy season. We had to uh, work with that. And uh, so we didn't start school till about the 1st of October, I think. We got out in July. So, uh, but about two weeks. And then we had a few days at Christmas, because that's when I went, that's when we took our trip to uh, Al Alamaya and mm -hmm. the Tahara. I was just thinking of when you had your breaks, your, your large breaks, mm -hmm. when you went home. Oh, if that was well, that, that, was, uh, that was the summer. You okay. Could, yeah. And some stayed there because we went at different you times. Uh -huh. But that was that was three months mm -hmm. really. Okay. It was just that when we got home, we'd usually tour on the way home, and we'd plan a tour back. They gave us about six weeks at home here, and that was really long enough to live around with family. You know, mm -hmm. it was you. I I have had a dear dear sister in law that just let us be her. That was our home base here in Stillwater, and we could pile our clothes, all the new things that we wanted to take back, and and that's where we packed out from the se the second time. Mm -hmm. But that time we went back, we uh, say I was pregnant that at that trip back, and that would have been what year? That was fifty eight. Fifty eight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you were there for two years, and then you had a break. Right. Came home. That's when you went. Around, around, mm -hmm. and so did the whole circuit, right? Okay. And and then because I always said Don should write a book called Around the Earth Before Birth, <laughs> and, <laughs> and but he didn't, he hasn't yet anyway. And but um, uh, then we had when I got back, we had three little boys fairly close together. Another another couple had a mm -hmm. child, but they went to Addis. I just went up with her. I stayed in the in the room, kind of helped her in the room. It was a far cry from our hospitals. And then three weeks after hers was born, I had ours, Dawn. And then I think it was about maybe a month to six weeks, the Evans. And both Evans and I, I stayed. We stayed at the college and had it then. And so so at home. how far was Addis from? Gemma. Or how many hours drive? Or? It took us all day. Mm -hmm. I I want to say 200, but I'm not sure mm -hmm. anymore. Isn't that awful? I've forgotten that. Because we just took it as a picnic day, and there were two mission stations, the Sudan Interior Mission, two of those on the way, about a third, and we that we'd stop and get a break there on driving because it was pretty tough driving mm -hmm. and one one summer we drove to uh, Esmera and that's three days to drive up there and one day of it is all in the mountains <laughs> you just never come down out of mountains you go up like this and you go down like this and up, you know it's a it's just a beautiful country though beautiful. It was rain. It'd be rainy season, so you, everything was green. And uh, it was where, I'm, I'm just talking from the Gemma point of view because I understand the country, the geography, the, the land laying and everything was so totally different down at Hara. Mm -hmm. And it, it looked different to us too. It's in the mountains, but it was different. And now, now, what Altitude were you at in Gemma? Where we were, it was six thousand. Okay. Addis so you was, had yeah, you had some altitude, right? Uh, you get short of breath mm -hmm. very easily, and there would have been concern differences with the crops. And yes, so on yeah. because of the altitude. And main the main crop though was coffee mm -hmm. at that altitude, and but corn grew as tall as this room, big old heavy thick ears on it, and. So corn was an important crop to them. And they tried, I, I don't know what all the farm people did put out, they tried a lot of different things. 
things that I saw that for health, from health point of view, was the um, animal husbandry man sent out his students with roosters, white roosters, and they were beautiful things. Well, they hawks could see those white roosters too clearly, and so he switched to a dark chicken, and it helped that. Then um, we began to we their little chickens only had little tiny eggs and. We bought them at the market. We just go down to the market and buy if we didn't have enough eggs, because we had quite a few eggs and meat and things up on the campus. But we go to the that local market. We could buy very small eggs, and in a year or so, we begin to see bigger eggs. And even the missionaries spoke about that too. That they were buying, they they were finding bigger eggs in the marketplace now, and so that. Gave you, gave you encouragement. This, you know, not everything's going to work, but, but this is. Yeah, mm -hmm. something was working. Because right, the and it was something they could eat, and they ate, they ate a lot of, mm -hmm. and they that was their protein really. Mm -hmm. They they had beef, and that we didn't care for their beef, um, but and their chickens wasn't all that meaty, but by introducing a heavier breed chicken. So the the, the farm people, the, the ones that went in with their animal husbandry and their their crop rotations and things, they really, the, the problem was we took a tractor and that, that was uh, something that, that would never have worked there. Um, even they even thought the mules went too fast. <laughs> they preferred their ox and to them. It was more slow and to their pace. Yeah. Or they did it by hand. Mm -hmm. There is my do and, it by hand. And perhaps based on the the type of soil right. and so uh -huh. on, it needed right. a little more individual attention. Was that the uh, case or it was just what people were used to? Well, it their main I don't even know where they got their main food, because I never learned to like it. I didn't like that hot, hot pepper. Uh, a lot of them did, mm -hmm. and but if it burned my lips, I didn't like it. And um, they, but it was the vegetables. Now we could grow beautiful vegetables, and the only fruit was more like the tropic. But we, passion fruit and and. That he was a little short banana that shipped in from uh, down in the southern part or something. We didn't. We had banana trees, but they didn't seem to produce any. And uh, I can't remember if there was. I want to say mangoes, but I don't think so. We had some pineapple that would grow even at that altitude, but not heavily. We didn't do a lot. But um, something like oranges or peaches or anything that was, that was nearly always shipped in either from Israel or um, uh, which wasn't Israel even at the time. I mean, I guess it was. It was Israel, but uh, it wasn't because we, I went over into that on a trip. I did take that tr trip and it was Jordan at the time. So the, the Six Day War came up later and, and drew some more boundary lines there, but uh, Italy and Israel were where we got most of our fruit, if what we did get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there were still trading ties with Italy, even though there had been that history during the war. I don't know if it was actually that, or I don't know how they... Just practicality? Yeah, mm -hmm. how somebody shipped it in, because it, it would have to come in on the plane. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I our plane, I don't know if it ever went all the way to Italy or not. I think, but it, I think Cairo was almost as far north. It may have. I, a lot of those things I didn't know then and I wouldn't know now. Mm -hmm. Now, were there, were there any administrative problems in getting materials, either medical or other supplies, just because you were working mm -hmm. through OSU, but uh -huh. at the same time you were working with the Ethiopian government, so right. there's two layers of bureaucracy. Uh, right. And 
<clears throat> as long as we didn't take the doctor away during the uh, the work hours, mm -hmm. nobody ever bothered us at all. Uh, our student, if anything was serious, uh, they went to add us. We just put them on the plane, took them, shipped them because we didn't dare. When I think now, when I think of all having those babies down there, what I could have run into, you have to know God was with us. <laughs> Because <laughs> I think about that now, what would I have done? Because yeah. uh, we did have, I had one that I had a real frightening experience with, and and the children were different ages. We had several, but they were so many different ages. And this one boy, about 14, climbed up in a what they called a work a tree. It was just a big old tree, but it kind of corky limbs it went and he, one Saturday afternoon he was building a tree house up in that and he fell he was 30 feet I think he said he fell but we it was rainy seasons and the ground was soft under it that probably saved him uh, his mother told me we his mother and I were friends for ever after that but um, they he scratched got scratched up a little bit and so I at that point, our doctor, our doctor Reuter, had gone to uh, hit on a leave, and a fill-in had come in from Latvia, and he had made friends with this family. They were she had them in for uh, meals and things, and so we called him to have it. Well, we got him, and he came over, and he just turned to me and he said, "Give him uh, some tetanus antitoxin," and. I didn't skin test him, and that night, in the middle of the night, they came to my door saying, oh my, Ellen has got hives all over him. So we had to get the doctor back and give him Benadryl and get that out, but uh, I wasn't aware, I mean, there was no place, any place that, and so they said, well, can you know to skin test him, and I said, well, I should have, but when the doctor said, give it. I didn't question him. I, mm -hmm. I didn't skin test him, and I thought the mother would hate me forever. But we probably were friends longer than when we moved to Nebraska. They came every year to see us for years and years and years. So mm -hmm. it was that it all worked out. <laughs> but it that was a that was a scary thing. Mm -hmm. I I was you know really felt my immaturity with that. But I'd been an OB nurse. When, when I went over. I didn't know all these things. It was honest about that. And, now, what was your, when, when you started working over there, what was your exact title? Was I was just school nurse. School nurse. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. did you have a, an additional title for, like instructor for your the health classes you were teaching? No, mm -hmm. no. I, the school nurse taught under, I mean, it was like another man was in charge and he pulled me in for, to do that one class, okay. and uh, so that that's how that one came about. Mm -hmm. And what did your responsibilities cover? You've you've touched on it a little bit, but just to make sure we've got everything. Well, I met, tried to make sure we kept our immunizations all up, so that if anybody traveled or whatever they had to have, it, uh, we didn't do the yellow fever that they had to go to Addis to get that, and also the smallpox. We still do, did smallpox then, and they did it at the Pasteur Institute. There's a little, the French was in there too. We were all there <laughs> helping every little point we could, and so they would do that. And But the rest of them, like our typhus and our typhoid and diphtheria and the baby shots and everything, we that, that was my responsibility. The other thing was if, you know, any injury, uh, they, there were so many things I couldn't do. One boy cut his wrist pretty bad, and I there was much I could do it taped. Mm -hmm. And but because the, there wasn't any point, the plane had just left for Addis, so we weren't going to see that again till the next day. And he's we just taped it. Well, he wound up with some ugly scars here. All I know the rest of his life he did, but. 
um, that was that was just the risk you take, right? You, you kept them together, though. Right. You know? it, it didn't get infected, mm -hmm. and and some of them did. Like one, they to cut grass, they used a kind of a sickle thing, oh. mm -hmm. and they chopped this. And one boy somehow hit the back of his hand and laid the skin back. Well, I took him out to the hospital, and they sewed it up, and it swelled up. So I took him back to see Dr. Ruder. You know, we didn't give him antibiotics like they do now. He, in fact, Dr. Ruder was very, very against. His, his first treatment of anything was to give Epsom salts, which my crew hated. And but he said that fleshes out the poison. You were you were saying that one of the reasons you weren't collectors, for right? Uh, we we didn't collect a lot because we. At the first two years is when the everything is new, and you're just so excited about everything. And we kept staying. When you stayed on, well, oh, we'll get one tomorrow. Yeah. This kind of thing. And so, we didn't come home with a lot of things. And this is, we had a leopard skin, and we had a what we got with Kindles. Kindles and us went out on a picnic. And Are you started yet? And uh, so, uh, and a water buck head, and just odds and ends. So, but we've moved several times since we've been in, back in the states, and every time something gets shoved back farther. So, it's a we just don't have it out. <laughs> Take a break. No, she okay. just was going to ask me something. Okay. Um. Now. Did the did the medical facilities you were you were touching on those? Mm -hmm. Did those change over time while you were there? What was available? Not particularly at the hospital, okay. and we had to go to Addis for anything serious enough that required surgery or, mm -hmm. or most of the babies went the, we went mm -hmm. up there. Um, we as we were be wanting to you know they started phasing out the kind of begin to let the Ethiopian director have a little more say and us a little less. And I said I had a helper. Well, I did. I had a, a fellow, a, a Otto Fergasa, Otto I think met Mr. But um, he was my helper. And so little by little, he began to take more responsibility of the students. And I just, and I didn't have a place to work. I didn't have anything to keep my things in, so we had a small house on that on the campus there, a very small one. And the students helped me. We cleaned it up. It had two rooms in it, and I made one in kind of a treatment room, and the other one I had as an office where I could keep my medicines and things. And I didn't see the students then that last two years. Mm -hmm. It was. But it was in that little ex little room there that uh, Kendall's little girl was born. <laughs> so uh, that, that it was just kind of shifted more to the staff mm -hmm. after that. Well, when you started, where did you where did you normally treat people? Wherever they fell out of a tree, oh, or <laughs> no? I actually had a little clinic okay. in a in one of the classroom buildings in the office that we had classrooms, office, and my my I had two rooms in one place and two on the other side okay. and we set up some beds and but there wasn't anybody to stay with them mm -hmm. and so uh, that didn't that was a good really a good plan um, at that time we boiled needles and we didn't have throwaways it's, it's I think about how really primitive <laughs> the whole thing was but um, it we lived through it and enjoyed it, so. <laughs> From a medical perspective, you mentioned that you were dealing with uh, both the folks from OSU who were mm -hmm. there, but also with the students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At, at first. Mm -hmm. That was sort of phased out then. And I didn't have to keep, I didn't keep records on them. That, uh, as they just, you know, Otto Fergasa could do that, and he was he he was what they called a dresser, and he had trained in Addis, so 
he it wasn't just somebody that we picked out of the right you know, bush out there, and he worked with Gwen right now too, so he was quite capable. Mm -hmm. And did he start working with you when you first got there? Right, okay. right. In fact, he introduced me to the clinic. See, it was by that time there was Gwen had gone, mm -hmm. and so I had to feel my way through that. And he was he was very helpful with it. And and I didn't know what I mean. It looked so austere. You know what? How do you how do you have a clinic with this? And I was too young to be scared, I guess, because we just went ahead and did what we had to do, and and I still say God was blessed all the way. <laughs> kept, kept everybody together right. enough to get on mm -hmm. the plane if right. they had to. Where, where things worked out. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what were the most common issues? You mentioned that tuberculosis was a problem with some of the students, uh, or the potential? Malaria. Mm -hmm. Malaria. That, and where we were, it was high enough, but you get, like our staff like to go boar hunting, and they have to go down into the lowlands for that. And we we had two, Conrad Evans was one that was very ill with malaria a time or two. And, but with the doctor there, he was able to give him what he needed, which we wouldn't have had. We wouldn't, I wouldn't have begun to know what to have given him. And uh, so, in fact, it sounded like a, a flu to me. And as a nurse, should never diagnose nor treat without, and there I was trying to do that. And so I gave him, I gave him antibiotics. And oh, the doctor about it. Yeah. First of all, he wanted to give him the Epsom salts. And it was a, not a tablespoon, it was an ounce. Little, we got him a little ounce box. And I bought those just down, down in the pharmacy downtown, mm -hmm. and they were, that was what he wanted to flesh them out. He'd say first, and then it only takes a third of the medicine. So, mm -hmm. but we didn't, as Americans, we didn't quite go along with all of that. <laughs> now, you mentioned the Italian doctor too. Was was he as much in contact with? Everyone is the German doctor. No, because he couldn't speak English, okay. and he or he wouldn't. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, we kind of avoided him. And what was his name? Do you remember? I'm trying to remember. Oh. I should, but we we can put it in later. Yeah, I just didn't. I it didn't come to me at all what it was. I'm sure some of the others remember, but no. Um, um, I do remember one of the first things that caught my eye when we came in and off of the plane. It was a rain, it was rainy season, it was July, mid-July, and the coming through the main street of town, here's a little shop there, quite a little shop, it says Singer above it, a Singer sewing machine. And that little fellow was a Lebanese a merchant, um, I don't know what he was, he, he made money anyway, and he had all these, they were just treadle sewing machines, but he would let, let us borrow them till our sewing machines got there. Huh? And if and they were treadle, then you didn't yeah. need the electricity. No, I, I could sew at free time. And so I got one of them. I did use one until mine came in. I just had a very small machine, but uh, then I would work of a morning and then after two, I could sew. And that, which is, was my hobby. So uh, that and tennis. One of the, the uh, Bill Vance, I don't know whether you met him or not yet, but uh, when they came to Gemma, he was not only taught English, but he was the sports. He was a sports person. He's really, he got them into soccer and I don't know what all. I mean, soccer was their main game anyway. Every kid downtown would walk along kicking, bouncing a little ball. But um, uh, then he built a, a staff tennis court, just a earth, hard packed earth, and and uh, the well, some of the townspeople could come up on Saturday afternoons and play tennis. But all of us women, 
learn to play tennis. We had tennis tournaments and we had no television and very little radio. Some BBC we had. Uh, we played we, in Addis. We could buy these great big discs to play on our uh, record player, you know, and they at least graduated out of the 45s. And so we had these. And uh, But other than that, we played a lot of uh, uh, hearts and pinochle and canasta and one, one was going to teach us bridge but oh boy that was way above my head. So, <laughs> well, did, did you manage to get the tennis rackets just in town there or had he brought some with? No, but more? they had them in Addis. Okay. We could, and I had a, uh, for Christmas, Lewis gave me a slozenger out of, and it had come from Addis, you know, they had them up there. You could buy almost anything in Addis. Okay. They that was a very modern town, and and of course the planes came in there frequent. You know, they the other planes came and shipped in there, but uh, they uh, that was that was the big day to get to go to Addis. And <laughs> you mentioned social life generally. What? Uh -huh. um, who were most of the people you socialized with? Other folks from OSU or? Uh, see, there was 10 families in this compound and we just did our own. We did Christmas together, Thanksgiving dinners together. We had Easter egg hunts for the kids, you know, Halloween. Birthday parties was for the kids. It was a big deal. And I, I, I tell you, I, I cannot praise Joy Evans enough. <laughs> She was good there, and she's good here, you know. And so it was a, just people like her that mm -hmm. real, real tight knit group. Mm -hmm. And it kept us. Uh, she just knew how to do those things, and so I can't. I just can't say enough good there. <laughs> the, Mar the Martha Stewart of Jim. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, as she, far as organizing she things. Could, she was a great cook. Mm -hmm. uh, she was younger than me. She is younger than me. She was a great cook. And uh, she didn't have a, somebody come in and do her bread baking. She did her own. You know, I had to have somebody break my bread. And, uh, but when it came to the children's birthday parties, she outshined. I mean, it was... and. Of course, she still does today with this OET, OEA thing. Mm -hmm. She is, she keeps it together. And so, if you don't want to put that on there, no, <laughs> it's okay. That's, but, no, but that's wonderful. It, it's um, it's just something we need to thank her for. Mm -hmm. more, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, no, that's because it's important. You know mm -hmm. what the social life was like there, and because everybody was a long way from home. And we, we were, and I, I, I think that's why we clung together and and we saw each other through hard times and really I don't think we had that bad of a time I just don't it just I mean oh sure there was a little flare now and then but it didn't amount to anything and I can't even remember them so <laughs> it might have if it was anything it was probably over who got that dresser <laughs> <laughs> And I, I do think there was a little rift once between Joy and Kendall and I over a dresser, but that's why I'm saying that. <laughs> well, no, and just, I mean, another potential source of conflict, conflict I suppose, you, you talked about the fact that you were teaching these health mm -hmm. hygiene classes. Mm -hmm. Were there any cultural issues either on the Ethiopian side or the American side, having a woman health instructor or having a woman... Uh, being so involved with their personal health care. Was that an issue for anybody? I never, I never felt that. Mm -hmm. uh, we had women teaching in the classroom mm -hmm. and if they, I don't know, I just felt like they, I know when our baby was, I taught my class that morning mm -hmm. and graded my papers and at Three o'clock. I knew I was in labor, and at six, I had a baby boy. And very efficient <laughs> of you. Oh, I don't waste time. <laughs> and the kids, those my little health class at that, they they could, they said, 
Why, Miss Mitty, Mitty Meissner, Mrs. You know, they were different terms that we did not know. Oh, my! I don't know how they could not have known, but uh, they were so forthcoming. And then when we left, they followed us to the plane, throwing flowers. You know that type of thing. So. So I never felt any cultural okay. differences at all. I had a little problem with learning to drive on the other side of the road, but <laughs> but so did everybody that came. We, it didn't take too long to get over there because we had American cars, so mm -hmm. our steering wheel was on the wrong side mm -hmm. there, really. But yeah. but, so, but it wasn't an issue for any of the Americans either, having a woman sort of be their primary health care person no, for a while. No, mm -hmm. it was... And and they would usually say, you know, I think I ought to go to Addis and take mm -hmm. care of this, and and that was up to them. Mm -hmm. That's where. Because I, mm -hmm. yeah. I was just trying to think of what things were like in the U.S. at that point. You know, it might have been a little unusual I, at that point. I don't know, because I I just left Stillwater Hospital mm -hmm. Obstetrics Department, mm -hmm. so I that was my that main. That was your yeah. Mm -hmm. After two years in Fort Smith of doing nursery and OB and then came here and did OB for another year almost it was a year I uh, that's about all I knew and now you mentioned some other women instructors at the school who else was there, well do you remember um, Norma Prentice who is down at Durant I think um, I think she was a history I think she taught history and uh, Darlington, it was at Darlington, and she may have been English for a year. And then Marcia Turner was music and library and that type of thing. She worked and and photography. She worked with them on that. So they had nothing. Oh, there was another. Uh, before I got there, was a Mrs. Horn. I don't remember her first name because they were just there a little while after we came. Mm -hmm. And she was also a history teacher. Her, uh, he was a horticulture and he was leaving and so Lewis took that. And, and then this uh, Mrs. Horn taught history. And you and mentioned that they got you two, you know, sort of two for the price of one. I mean, even though you were being paid and were on salary, they as a couple. So all yeah. of these other women came in as... if. With right. OSU husbands well, as well. No, or? they didn't. Okay. All of them didn't come as a as a employee. Okay. But they had, you know, we they gave us tickets mm -hmm. for them, and so uh, they didn't have to. Uh, I mean, with us, we had two employees there right. without, but uh, and the tickets would be that way because they had to pay my way right. anyway. And so that way they didn't have to pay a nurse separate. So, so it, the pair, the agriculture nurse pair, mm -hmm. helped with the white necks who were going on and they could set, set us in there. Yeah. So. I, I guess my question was mm -hmm. for the other people like Norma Prentice oh. um, or Marcia Turner, mm -hmm. they were all, they all came, their husbands were all working right. on the Ethiopian right. project yeah, as well. Right, yeah, they, they were all teachers okay. there already. Mm -hmm. I mean, hired for different, whatever they were teaching. Mm -hmm. But, uh, see, Joy, her husband was, a, I mean, he was really, he could do almost anything too. I think he was Aggie at all. But she wasn't, she didn't work there. She, she did plenty. She did a lot of work, but she was never paid. I don't think I. She was now when she went to the college. Very. She was just a gracious hostess. That was what she really was, and she could entertain the visiting people and very helpful with that. Where, um, like Mrs. Rauch, when they were there, she worked in the office. She was a. I don't think she taught, and. But they left a year after we, or their year was up, and then Kendall's came and Joanne didn't work either. Right. So she had talked about, I think, volunteering. Well, where, I, I can't remember if it was Mrs. Kendall or if it was Mrs. Jackson who talked about volunteering in the library. Um, and I, if 
if Joanne did, she, it was while she was at the college. I don't know what they right. did down there. That's and But and there in, in Gemma, she didn't uh, work. She'd worked all this time, and so it's kind of nice that she, I think, didn't, <laughs> didn't have to at that point. And so uh, that was, but there were some. Uh, Hydens, there was a couple named Hydens, and um, she didn't work. Grace Sigenthaler, I think she was a teacher, but I'm not sure she ever taught there, but she was secretary. She worked for, in the office and did that. So some of them had other jobs, mm -hmm. but um, uh, just to actually hire them for that, there were very few of us mm -hmm. that had to do. Uh, Milburn's was another one. She taught English, uh, I believe. Him and her both were teachers. And so I know he was English, but I'm not sure. Campbell's, uh, Jack taught, but Mary didn't. And so it was kind of... Just a mix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, if they, it just kind of helped if they could get a pair that could work like that, you know, but because uh, you'd hate to hire just a nurse and let the man sit around and do nothing, <laughs> which doesn't happen usually. But <laughs> now, just I, I, just hearing all of the things that you were doing, you must have been extraordinarily busy. Could you just walk me through? what a, a, an average day would have been for you, or if it was different from season to season. Just tell me maybe what you would have been doing on your average day if you were teaching and at the clinic. And well, that was the main thing I did because I had a girl that took care of our little girl okay. and the baby when I got a baby. So there was one employee. I had a boy that, that worked in the garden. I had a boy that cooked, and I had a boy that did the housework. So I wasn't all that busy. <laughs> uh, I tried to keep people well, because I always said that if a nurse is busy, then people are sick. So you don't want that. And so try to, you know, try to eat properly and drink your boiled water and that type of thing. Uh, we played tennis. That was quite, quite an exercise that we got every day. I, I would never thought I was a busy. Overwork. I never did. I sometimes had a lot of, well, stumbled over what should I do with this? You know, if it's something that I can take care of, or should they go to Addis and and it, that, get the doctor? You know that that probably bothered me as much as any anything that I ever had bothered me. Was I treating something properly? And that I got over that. <laughs> you just learn to live with that and if, if they felt like they needed to go to Addis then and some of them were they if they hadn't have gone they'd have been quite sick. Joy Evans had hepatitis and she she I, that was a new thing for me. I didn't we didn't know what hepatitis I'd known it. I had known of it, but I'd never seen it. How it reacted to indigestion, you know, what is this? And she just she had a little baby. And so we finally, you know, Conrad said, you know, one Saturday afternoon, he said, I, I guess we'll just have to go to Addis and see. So they put her in the hospital. And those of us at home then kind of watched after the kids and the two little kids and until she could get back home. And they really cautioned her about how to take care of herself. And she said, Oh my goodness! I felt so much better coming home, you know, than I did coming up. Mm -hmm. But she was very, very ill with that, and that scared me. And then one of the other women had it later, and uh, I don't know where, you know, I don't know how it came in, how it was just them. I don't know where it came from. And they, we had one child that had. Well, we've always said scarlet fever is strep throat with a rash, and he. Um, he, I did have to give all the other children penicillin. I mean, that doctor had me do that just as a safeguard. But he got along very well, and was. But he, his little old face was just popped out good, you know. 
<laughs> so they it's kind of to look at uh, listen think back at all those things it's so strange <laughs> Well, when you were teaching your health classes, you mentioned having the gardens and trying mm -hmm. to teach people proper eating mm -hmm. habits or how to how to mix, you know, how to get their proteins and their vegetables and so on. It didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> with 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 the Americans or or the folks in Ethiopia or both, uh, you know. Well, I, we we ate well. Mm -hmm. We had uh, such beautiful vegetables. Mm -hmm. You know, there really was. Uh, but their diet it was so limited. Mm -hmm. And I do remember one time they came and complained to me, the boys did, they said some of them want hot, hotter what mm -hmm. than, than what the others want. And the kitchen was having, now there's where I ran into probably some cultural differences. And I said, well, I don't, you know, I don't know what else to do, but um, let's make some pepper sauce. I really didn't know exactly how to make it, but we went over, the bo some boys and I did, and we went to the kitchen, and we chopped up some peppers and put them in fruit jars with holes in the top. And I put some vinegar water over them. I, I didn't know how to make it, but I knew that it's going to get hot. Well, I had picked them up. The, first of all, the cooks in the kitchen didn't care for me being in there. They did not like that. And they weren't very friendly. Well, we chopped up all these peppers and I gathered them up like this. And that night, if you think I like a jalapeno now, <laughs> never. I don't even that, that might account for your aversion to hot peppers. <laughs> oh, that it, just even in the tender here, we just burned all night long. And I, I slept with my hand in cool water. And, and don't so, rub your eyes, whatever and you do. I, I happen to not be. I'm just surprised I didn't. But when that hit, it was it, it wasn't at the time. It was maybe two or three hours before that burning hit, and I couldn't get rid of it. There was no amount of washing that off, and so that. But I didn't hit off real well with the cooks. They didn't like a woman being in there, and I could feel it. I could just sense that. So it was that. an all male, mm -hmm. yeah, staff in the kitchen, right. mm -hmm. and. So I didn't do that anymore for several reasons. <laughs> what were, you had mentioned Watt being a really popular local mm -hmm. dish, and other, other people have mentioned that as well. Well, a lot of them learned to like it. Mm -hmm. I just didn't. Too spicy. I would pick the eggs out mm -hmm. if they had boiled eggs in it, or I'd pick the chicken and kind of do this as much as I could. But as far as tasting that hot, I never did like it, and I don't like hot chili. So mm -hmm. that's that goes with me. And but a lot of them liked it, and they send for spices, and and they do you know they like that. And I guess there's several stores that are carrying it for them now. So mm -hmm. now, what what else was part of the local uh, food tradition? You had what? Uh, the hard bread, the like, kind of like the Italian type bread because okay, it's so the Ethiopian, crusty, heavy, yeah, yeah, and you could smell them baking that mm -hmm. down, and it, but man, that was hard once you get it, you know, it was, but oh, I don't know, six o'clock in the morning or something, you could smell the, the, and our school was up here on a hill, like, and then you went down. I remember it downtown and kind of turned, and then the main street was down. We had a little hotel down there, and that's where we, that was one of our social things, was to go to the hotel. I never cared for spaghetti until I learned to actually eat Italian herbs and spices in it, you know. And now I don't like this plain stuff very well. I'm getting, after 40 years, I'm getting back into it, but uh, that was, often a good thing we would do and uh, as a group would go down and have have spaghetti and then at the at that little hotel there was a movie theater that if you just close you could hear it but uh, <laughs> it was more lip reading yeah it was the same fellow that had uh, the singer sewing machine he also had that theater and An entrepreneur. We, yeah, and so we, if there was a movie that we liked, 
But otherwise, we just waited till we went to Addis and saw a movie up there. So that was that was always a treat, really. Though. Well, you mentioned as part of a tie into the social life, you mentioned mm -hmm. that you kept up a lot of the American traditions, like Halloween mm -hmm. and so on. Um, were were there things that you had to do differently for some of these holidays? Could you get a turkey at Thanksgiving or a Chris what did you do for a Christmas tree at Christmas? We had, I don't know where they got the turkeys. I guess they ordered them. I don't, we did have turkey. Mm -hmm. And we had, were both Thanksgiving and Christmas. I Maybe that, I would, off the top of my head, I'm thinking that, that the animal husbandry fellow probably raised them for mm -hmm. us or something. Mm -hmm. and. I, I just don't too really. big for the hawks. Yeah, yeah. They and they were speckled and they chased the hawks. I guess. But that was a the hawks was really a, a a thing. You could be roasting meat on a, a you know like a grill. I had a small grill because we had to use charcoal to heat our water with, and so we all had charcoal. But those they would swoop like this and pick your meat off and go, or you could throw it. And they would swoop. So I don't know where our turkeys came from, but we did have turkey, and we always had ham because they came in in tins too. And and so we, uh, uh, between Joy and Grace Sandthaler, we had great meals. I mean, they could plan and cook, and <laughs> so there wasn't anything that was too much different. I didn't for the see holidays. anything different. Okay. We, it was hard. There was nothing to make a Christmas tree out of much. So I did order a little artificial one, but some of them used coffee trees. They, they would get a coffee tree and uh, fix it. So we had a Christmas tree, of some type, and we get Christmas. And and as you know, you haven't asked about what did we do for church or anything, but mm -hmm. the Sudan Interior Mission had a about three miles had a mission out of town and they would we couldn't go with the students because the emperor did not want his religion messed with the Coptic he did not you could mess with the Muslim or the pagan but leave his Coptic alone mm -hmm. and so the missionary would have a service for the students I think he started out with his own group first which he did in Amharic and then he would do the students our students who got their own way out. They, I was going to say, did they all yeah, go out they, on their own? Whoever or? wanted to, because some of them came from mission schools. Right. See, they were educated in, in, like, in mission, even though there was a uh, government school there. But um, a lot of them came high, highly educated. They were through the eighth grade, really. And then he would give us a, there was three services he would do for us, and it was, it was simple. It was little, uh, the little mission schoolhouse with uh, benches and and a uh, uh, tin roof and built out of sod on the side, like like the, the their their stuff of straw and everything they put in it to make it. But it was uh, it was what where the, they had school out there and church as well. So we sat in the school and there again. The, we had a baby dedication out there, so that is unique. I think to have have a, joy started it, and so all of us with our babies had a, this little dedication in that little African building, so the little Ethiopian building. I thought that was kind of unique. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, was this group of where was this group of missionaries from? Well, it was called the Sudan Interior, mm -hmm. and. Actually, it was an interdenominational. Mm -hmm. um, they, there was, it there was no certain church preached. They, they were all kinds, and they had been in Ethiopia first. Then, when it got bad in, in Ethiopia, they were, they went over into the Sudan, and waited until the things calmed down, and then they came back, and but they kept that name. And what what? nationality were oh, most of the missionaries? Well, most of them were from the U.S. Okay. But so they were New Zealand, England, Canada, and Australia. Mm -hmm. We had them all there. And there may have been from some other place too, but I know of that many different countries that they were from. And 
I, I, at at our, our mission school, the head fellow, his family, they were from uh, Michigan uh, and then someplace here. Then the nurse was from Canada. The nurse was from Australia and uh, Bertha Zimmerman, the teacher, was from Canada. And that's the way that was. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we had others that we, from, at other, because we visited several of those stations around, they were always very hospitable. And they kept a guest room. So uh, I, I had learned that they would know more about a country than that, but I didn't learn that in time. When we came through Hong Kong and some of those places, if I would have contacted a mission, they would have shown us what we really wanted to see instead of what a tour guide <laughs> will show you. you know? <laughs> but I didn't learn that in time. So. Now, you mentioned schools, which brings up the question of where most of the kids went to school. Now, your daughter, your oldest daughter, mm -hmm. would have been old enough to well, be going to school by the time you left, uh, or I just home barely? Okay. I, guess, I guess that's what you would say. She was just five when okay. we came home. And Sigan Thaler had a little boy just the same age. Mm -hmm. So uh, I started, I did do work with, with Luann, and she could read. She, by the time we got home in first grade here in Stillwater, she, it was a good thing, because she was scared to death. She'd never lived with people. It had always been just her little group, see. And uh, so uh, they would come, and I had ordered from, well, I ordered them from Whitman's, but I had started getting them like at Woolworth's or something, just these little teach yourself books, but that's all I had. I'm not a teacher. So I, but I took those and, and Luann, I, every day I would work with her some until she could read. But the other mothers that had children in school, they organized a school room and they took, each one of them took a, a class and so it was like, it was very much like what you would have at home. Mm -hmm. And because all the children were in the room and then the mothers took, took to their teach. turn with each, you know, I teach English, I teach, you know, that. So, uh, and Luann was just ready to start the first grade when, when we okay. came home. So she never, uh, I just had the little second they were boy and me and, and Luann and so. Well, and Luann turned out to be a teacher, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been your good influence. <laughs> well, I couldn't teach. I, I, I said after they got, you know, into third grade math, I began to have to scratch my head over that one. And so I was never very good in math. <laughs> well, we talked about keeping up American traditions in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Were there any Ethiopian traditions? that you picked up from the students or from the community? Not, I, their Christmas was not the same as date as ours. They had mm -hmm. theirs in January. And was it like the Russian Orthodox Church where it's about two weeks off? Or well, was it a little we more? Well, we didn't get that, they, they didn't get that much time out of school. Mm -hmm. They, I think they got more of the time when we did, but uh, we didn't take off a lot of time. And because the boys couldn't go home see they would have had nothing to do so we it was better to keep keep them until time for them to go and even then it was they didn't always have ways out but it was I, as far as picking up any of theirs and I don't know I always thought it was kind of strange that we never I, I've just thought of this in my recent like last two weeks or something we had a family here that had done some mission work in, the, actually uh, navigators, I think they said they were with, in South Africa. And they came home and their first child, they named him uh, South, they said his second, his, they named him Masala. His second name would be Masala. And they were only there five months. And I thought, here I was there five years and it didn't occur to me and none of us that I know of gave our children an Ethiopian name at all. And yet Masala was a very, was a South African name. So I thought, isn't that strange? We all 
none of us came up with that name, hmm. with a with a Ethiopian name, and I think. But when I hear them, when I hear people, you know, like I, a girl came, she was at Langston going to school, and she came over to work where I was working, and when they they just told me that while we were this, she has to put 30 hours in with this field with her nursing over there, so mental health, and so. I said, well, what's her name? And oh, they stumbled over her name, and I said, let me see that. And it was an Ethiopian name. So when she came, oh, her English was so good. You know, it was so good. But she said her brother was a banker in Gemma. And so it was, it was just kind of like home, coming home or something. Mm -hmm. And yet, if, if she hadn't been able to speak English, well, I'd have been just, blank. I never tried to learn. I just, just smattering. You know. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, were there any particular political tensions or problems that you remember while oh, you were there? Oh, there, among the Americans? Well, no. <laughs> well, that, <laughs> that too. <laughs> well, that, that was a story of my own. I had to, do. but as far as the country was concerned, <laughs> it was a, uh, we had the, uh, now I'm not sure which was the police, I think the police had a school across from ours, and the, go out and go up to the hospital, on that corner there was the army. And during that a coup, which Lewis will tell him about because he was involved with it more, we were just caught down country with it, but they, they kind of got into a battle and it carried, it started in Addis, and it just kind of branched out, and it lasted a, maybe three days or something until the emperor got back, but um, we didn't know what we were going to do down, in, down there. We didn't know how to get out or anything. I had the passports and you know, kids and things, and so did all the others, but Lewis had gone to Addis, and so uh, that was a his his was much more frightening than ours were, but when my cook went to leave that night, he said, now they're not after you, not after the Americans, they're at each other. But he said crossfire can be uh, very dangerous. I mean, in his way, he said very English, broken English, he would, but I could understand him. And he said, you stay in this house, do not go out, because he knew this was gone, and. And I said, well, will you be all right? And he said, oh, yeah, he, he, he knew his way home without getting into trouble. But, uh, and he didn't live downtown. That's where it was worse, was down. And that was, I, we were talking about that today. That had to be, I think, about December of 59 in that area. I don't, I'm sure it was about that time. And it was near enough Christmas that, we had planned a Christmas party for our class, and I'm a, I think I baked about 40 different kinds of cookies. <laughs> it kept me busy, where I didn't have to think about it. And really, he just got home. Just, I didn't even know if he'd make it home for the party or not. But he made it home in the afternoon before our little party. And, and they, all the boys were so glad to see him come home. Of course, he had one of the students with him. Mm -hmm. And it was it was not a fun time. Well, was he up there because of the coup, or no. did he just happen to get he, caught he'd out? He'd been sent up to pick in a Land Rover and a student to pick up mattresses, ah. and um, they got the mattresses and finally got out. I think Conrad Evans was up there too, and uh, they he was bringing a mis missionary's wife and her little boy home from for the Christmas holidays from the. The mission school was in Addis, and mm -hmm. so she could speak in Herrick, and the student could speak, Lewis couldn't say. So if he hadn't had somebody with him to, they they would have chopped those mattresses all to pieces. I Maybe, I don't know. It was He said it was frightening. So they ran into yes, people in a on, road the, on the way. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. the roadblock the outside of Addis. Mm -hmm. and Do they remember whether it was the police or the military? or At that point, at that point, 
no, I, I don't remember which it was. But he he didn't understand when they told him to coom. He, he said he thought he got his he thought it meant go, mm -hmm. and the guy really got unhappy. So the missionary wife said, "You better stop." I said that's what and. So he wanted to know what he had, and he was going to understand. And so, they, if it hadn't been for the student and the missionary, mm -hmm. he would have been in a lot of trouble. But uh, the way it was, they, the student explained and let him feel between the mattresses that they weren't sneaking people around, and so it, uh, they got home. But uh, uh, that was. That was probably the only time that we, and I can't say I was frightened. I just, it was one of those things you are a little numb, and if you keep busy, you get through it. Mm -hmm. And at that point, Bob Meissner was the um, uh, administrator or, or superintendent or president or whatever we call him now. He called me in, and I guess he called everybody. But I will say, uh, I don't know, do you know Bill Abbott? Well, he was the one in charge of this program when we were hired. He wrote letters to all of our families here at home. And the, my mother never got over that. She lived to be 102. <laughs> and she never got over it that he cared enough. And she finally got to thank him for it. So that was, that was a, one of those nice things that you remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this was at the time of the coup. At the that coup, written a letter, because written letters saying everybody was okay, right. and, mm -hmm. and not to worry that if that we would be allowed to be taken out safely if needed. And she said, "Why well, she she you know they'd heard it on the news." Mm -hmm. And she said, "I didn't think about how dangerous it might be until she got the letter." And she said, "Why? I just thought." How, he, I mean, here's my little old Paris, yeah. and, but she finally got to thank him. And <laughs> so they met for later that, for on. writing that letter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. And we were eating out one night with her, and he was in there, and so I told him about it, and he said, "You've just made my day," because <laughs> he he was by himself. His wife was very ill, and he was by himself. So. That was that was one of the nice, you know, the things that was done for our families. That, that it sometimes we forget to appreciate enough. Mm -hmm. Now, did that stop anything that was going on at the at the school in Gemma? Did we kept just right on going? with classes. Mm -hmm. The students were a little unnerved by it, but we never stopped. It didn't last that long, and the. But it was, I'd say we had a couple of days or three that it was pretty tense then, and I, I was worse in Addis. That's where they really were having trouble. But um, they said as soon as the emperor came back, see, he wasn't in the country. And as soon as he came back, because the army had, I think it was the army had taken control of the, of the airport. But when he came in, that little man about that tall, very impressive, very impressive. And the other really, really good thing I remember about the emperor was the Americans put on a talent show one night, and I didn't realize we had that much talent. <laughs> it wasn't from Gemma. <laughs> we didn't do it. But from the, the embassy people and the other Americans there, they and the emperor came. And, and was this at... Addis in Addis. Okay. It was in Addis at some, I don't remember the name of the opera house, but it was, and and the, we all dressed up the best we could dress up because that was required at that point, very formal. And then the emperor came in and everyone stood up, you know, and here's this, it's shocking how short he was, you know, but such a power that he had over those people. and. Uh, that that quieted down. So even though I've never heard any whole lot of great things came out of Ethiopia, I, I do know the emperor loved his people and he wanted 
this college. He wanted education for them, and that was that was why we were there. With Truman's point four program, and it took that long to get it going, which was in the early 50s when they stopped. And then Dr. Bennett, of course, pushed it. So. Now, what, in your opinion, was the part about living in Ethiopia that tended to cause the most culture shock for Americans going over? The flies. <laughs> I have never... And to hear a hyena squeal, that, that's a... If you don't know what it is, it, it's a weird sound. And that we heard almost like we would hear coyotes here, you know. Well, this is this is common there because of the the uh, uh, the market would throw out the bones and the scraps of from, and so well, you might as well keep going. <laughs> so, well, just one one more one or two more questions here, just to just to finish up. Um, once you got back to the U.S., mm -hmm. what, were, what were things like once you finally left? What was it like getting readjusted? I don't know that I have a, had a, I can't remember, maybe not having a cook and a housekeeper and a gardener, I, I had to do my own stuff. <laughs> I hadn't done that for five years, so, but I just, you know, we lived here a year and then we moved to Nebraska, and I never, I never really felt any change I, that I know of. It was nice to be back with family again, and and uh, we don't, we didn't keep up close, as you know, we all scattered when we came home, and, and but it was always good and still good to see them. It's that we're losing them, but it's good to see the women. It's the men. That, <laughs> it seemed to have played out on us here. Mm -hmm. Well, are there any questions that I haven't asked that you wished I'd asked, or mm -hmm. or that um, anything you wanted to talk about? Oh, you mentioned the movies, uh, taking oh. movies. Was oh. that while you were there? Or, you mean taking I mean, uh, doing uh, oh. video? Well, or? we didn't. Ha we just had a little bell and howl. Mm -hmm. We we still have that little bell and howl, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and that was our where we could go out. Now, Lewis enjoyed the hunting and the fishing up there. He has never cared for it here. It's, you don't catch fish like that here. And uh, so he, the camera was nice to, to keep us, uh, when we look back at those, you know. Um, there was just a lot of things on that order that, that keeps our memories jogged on that, but there's a lot of other things I forget too. But I, I, we came home. I don't know that I felt any, any adjustment or any change. Or I adapt easily. And, and what about so. what about the children? Now I would say that Luann probably had had the hardest time because she had two little friends over there just about her age, and they played together a lot. Tommy Siegenthaler was her age, and they all. They were just kind of their own little group. And we got home, and she, we, I lived over on Doty, so she went to Highland Park School over here. And here's, she's thrown in a class with 30 kids or so. If she had, she even said, she said, if you hadn't taught me to read, I don't think I, I was so scared, I didn't know what to do. And she didn't want to go to school. I had to push her to get her to go to school. So it, I think it was hard for her, and then she just went a year, and then we moved to Nebraska, so she had to readjust up there. But she's done it great. She's a tr tr <laughs> Kids world traveler bounce, now. Yeah. yeah, she's they've traveled. They went back to the, themselves to the Holy Land, and and uh, they've been to New Zealand a couple of times. So they've learned to, you know, she's came out of it all right, and then. Then in Nebraska, you notice that Marilee is, is Native American. Well, we adopted her up there at Sioux. She's Sioux. And uh, 
So she's here, and the other one's up there. <laughs> in the two, one's in Dallas, and one's in Tulsa. So. Okay. But I, I guess all of us kids are all over the place, <laughs> especially when Gary Ray winds up in Alaska. So. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much well, for sitting down and talking about this. Well, thank you for listening to me, about but this. you're going to have to edit that no. very closely. <laughs> and, uh, because I get to ramble, and it really rambles. And no. I don't. You, you had wonderful stories, and, and we do thank you. <laughs> well, well, I tell you, that, that was, I don't know how they picked the people. I don't know what they did to screen the people, but I thought to be that close, to, living that close together for that long at a time, had, that was a great bunch of people. How, I mean, we were all, as I said, maybe there was a little tip now and then, but on a whole, it was, we had good times together. We had picnics, we had camping trips, we had, um, I just didn't learn to like what. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. <laughs>